Welcome back to Disciple Talk, my brothers and sisters, as we continue to study in this exhilarating gospel, the gospel of John, we're studying to see the glory of Jesus Christ. If you've been with us in our first five parts of this gospel, we tried to take time to introduce this gospel, and now we're in chapter one, and we're taking our time as we go through chapter one because this gospel's purpose is to reveal the person of Jesus Christ. Today we'll be going through the Gospel of John chapter 1, verses 6 through 18. And I'm going to read those verses at this time. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 6 through 18. The Word of God from the New King James Translation reads, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld the, his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And all his fullness we have received grace for grace, for the law was given through Moses. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father has declared him. Amen. Praise the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of the Holy Writ. You know, I'm just so excited about this gospel, and I pray as we're studying this gospel that, that, that you will be blessed as well as we continue to deal with this great subject of seeing Christ in his glory. I want to reiterate, I think the greatest need for the church today is to see the glory of Christ. Uh, all the things we're trying to be involved in without his glory being the the permeating and exhilarating part of our worship and mission and, and, and focus in seeing him in his glory, his kingship, his lordship. This is what we're seeking to keep on your minds as we study the gospel of John. I want to read something to you before we go to the actual text about the person of Christ, uh, an article that was written by Dr. Brandon D. Crow associate professor of New Testament at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. Listen to what he says about Jesus Christ and his incarnation. In the incarnation, the Son of God takes a true body and a reasonable soul. He is born of a virgin, which is fitting for the pre-existent Holy Son of God. His unique birth means he was not implicated in the sin of Adam, but stands at the head of a new creation. As son of God, Jesus is the fulfillment of David and Adam. He is more than that. He is the son of God eternally. He is Emmanuel, God with us, the son of the living God. It is thus fitting that his sonship is proclaimed at his baptism tested in the wilderness and confirmed in the transfiguration, mocked in the crucifixion 
and vindicated in his resurrection. Yet the son of God does not act in isolation from the father and the spirit for the eternal works of the Trinity are undivided. God, the son of God did not first come to be in the first century Palestine, meaning he just didn't show up for the first time when he was incarnated as a baby and grew up in Palestine. Jesus Christ existed even before the world began. He created and upholds the world and he has definitively accomplished redemption for his people. He is our God and Savior, the eternally begotten Son of God. We want to thank Dr. Crow for reminding us of the deity of Christ and his incarnation. Now, as we turn our attention to the text, we begin now, after we studied last week about Jesus being the light of the world, and in him is life, and this life is the light or the spiritual illumination of people who would believe. Today, we turn to see his glory in the ministry of John the Baptist. Here in chapter 1, verse 6, we move now to the witness of John the Baptist. And in verses 6 through 18, we're going to look at some of the highlights of John's ministry as he is witnessing and proclaiming the Son of God as coming into the world. In verse 6, the Bible identifies John the Baptist. As you know, John was uh, a few months earlier than, than born a few months earlier than Christ because his mother Elizabeth was pregnant at the same time Mary was pregnant with the Christ. And they even came together in their time before they delivered the children. And when Mary greeted Elizabeth when they first met, they said that John, who was in his mother's womb, leaped. Uh, Elizabeth said that, that the babe leaped because here at this beginning of their uh, uh, prenatal time, the, the Holy Spirit was active. The same spirit that prophesied on the birth of John the Baptist also was the same spirit that prophesied to Mary and, and in regard to Jesus coming. And uh, so here we see at their, before they were even born physically, that they had a connection spiritually by the Holy Spirit. But now John has been uh, grown. He's now living out in the wilderness. Uh, the Bible says his lifestyle was one out in the midst of the rules where he was out there preaching about the coming Messiah. His attire was uh, camel's hair and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And thus John the Baptist would not be the average kind of person you would want coming into the synagogue in Jerusalem. That's why he was out there in the wilderness. But what was he doing? He was bearing witness to the coming Messiah. And in verse 6, they say there was a man who, whose name was John, John the Baptist. This man came for a witness. Now, that's why John came. That was his life purpose and ministry, was to bear witness of the light, the L-I-G-H-T. Jesus is the light of the world. He is the life of the world. And John's primary ministry was to bear witness of the light. Why? So that all would believe through him, believe when Christ came. Remember, John was baptizing, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. And then it says in verse 8, he was not that light, meaning John the Baptist was not the light, but was only sent to bear witness of the light. So what does this teach us? It teaches us in verses 6 through 8 that there must be some preparation. There must be some preparation for the the king coming. And, and as we say, John the Baptist was his forerunner. He was the one who would call people to repentance to prepare the way of the Lord. 
so that when he came and people recognized him, they would believe on the Messiah, the glorious Savior of the world. So John's ministry was to prepare the way, to call people to, be, to believe on him who was coming. And thus, he was sent to bear witness of the light. What kind of light? Verse 9 says, the true light, which comes and gives light to every man coming into the world. Now, I want to say something about this for preachers and those of us who preach and teach, especially in these last days in our fallen society, where even in the church, you hear ministers, pastors, and so-called Christian leaders giving testimony about other gods, other religions, other beliefs as pathways to God. Now, you won't find that in the Gospel of John. John didn't come to bear witness to all the other possible religions or beliefs that, that, that somebody else could believe in. He came to bear witness of one person, the coming Messiah. And we would do well today, especially in the church, for those who have been seduced away from the fact that there's only one Christ, there's only one Savior, there's only one way to heaven's gates, there's only one Savior of the world, there's only one mediator between God and man. And as we celebrated last week, the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, there was only one person who got on that cross. His name was Jesus Christ. And there was only one person who has bodily risen from the dead, and his name is Jesus Christ. So all you leaders out there that Pluralism and religious pluralism has seduced you away from the sole testimony that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He is the only way. There is no other name giving under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. We need to make sure we don't uh, compromise that testimony. John the Baptist reminds us that he was sent to bear witness of the light. And every God-called Christian, redeemed, regenerate child of God will testify that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and that he is God's uh, a person, the God, the God man who was sent to die for our sins and to be the source of eternal life. We, we can't compromise with the world, church. We, we can't play the religious pluralism and political correctness. We can't be afraid to call on the name of Jesus Christ and him alone. We can't be afraid to say that our testimony is about Jesus Christ and him alone. As Paul said, we preach Christ crucified. We don't preach nobody else. And sadly, for any so-called preacher or teacher who, who, who doesn't hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ as the sole way to salvation. You need to go back and read your Bible and make sure you want to teach what the Bible say instead of being politically correct or you've been seduced by the doctrines of demons. Let me pick up in verse 10 because here we see further evidence of the glory of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, Jesus Christ was in the world. And the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. We said that a few weeks ago. He's the creator. All things were made by him, and without him was nothing made. He was in the world, but the world, the, the, the world did not know him because the world is blinded by sin, blinded by spiritual darkness, as we talked about last week. Look at verse 11. But he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now, what that implies is that when he was born into the Jewish uh, 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 life as a Jew, the Jews were the ones who had been given the, old, the, the, the law, and, 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 and had God had revealed himself to them in the Old Testament. They were the ones who had heard the prophets prophesy about the coming Messiah. And now when he has come and incarnated himself, many of the Jewish people did not believe on him. They rejected him. Some did. Some did not. Thus, the fact is, it says he came to his own, 
and his own did not receive him. But verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right. Hear that? He gave the right to become, here it is, children of God to those who believe in his name. Ain't nobody else's name, just his name, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of, but by the will of God, nor the will of man, but the will of God. Now let me read verses um, uh, 12 and following from the New Living Translation. 1 John 1, 12 says this, But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn or born again. This is not a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan. This rebirth comes from God. Y'all get it? This is a work of God, work of the Holy Spirit. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. So we see in verses following the verses 12, 11 through 14 or 13 that those some people didn't receive them. But those who did believe on him as the Christ were gi are given a new birth. Now, let me make that practical application. Is that what happened in your life when you believe? Did you realize that the Holy Spirit moved on you to convict you of sin and he revealed to you the reality and the truth of the Messiah, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for you, who rose from the dead? And you called on his name because you believe he is the savior of the world. And in that calling, the Bible says, he who calls on the name of the Lord to be delivered from their sins shall be saved from their sins. Is that what happened to you? Don't you remember that you called on him? You believe, and it says plainly right here in the scriptures, but as many, verse 12, as re received him, believed on him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Praise the Lord. So we learn here, John comes to bear witness. And in his witness, it goes back to the testimony that he is the son of God, the light of the world, and that he can save you if you believe. Now look at verse 14. Look at verse 14. It says here, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he, he beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And here the, the Bible is teaching under the testimony of John the Baptist that the word, the logos, as we discovered in, in John 1.1, 1, 1, became human. That's what it means. He became a man. The logos, the very thought of God, was incarnated into human flesh. And listen to what it says about the incarnation. The incarnation of the Son of God is at the heart of the Christian faith. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ's first coming is essential for the reconciliation of God and humanity and for Jesus' ongoing mediation on our behalf. While there is an element of mystery surrounding the incarnation, the person of Jesus Christ, the God-man, there are many foundational non-negotiables that we affirm to be true to the biblical revelation and that honor the witness of the church throughout her history. And here we have this forerunner, John the Baptist, the one who would prepare the way in the spirit of Elijah. And in verse 14, the word became flesh and walked among us. And the Bible says, and we beheld his glory the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In that 14th verse, we hear the witness that, that John is saying that we saw him. 
we saw him in a human body. The God man, the incarnate son of God. And what did he see? We beheld his glory. We beheld the presence of the son of God in human flesh. You know, this, this just begs for us to take a moment to just think about what do you think about when you think about Jesus Christ? Do you, you trying to figure out what color he was? You trying to figure out how tall he was? You trying to figure out all his human natural features? Listen, listen to what they say they got captured in in verse 14. He became a human. He was in a human body. And the scripture says what they remember, what John the apostle wrote in this 14th verse and what John the Baptist saw, we beheld his glory. They saw him in a human state, but yet in that human state, his glory superseded everything. This is God in the flesh. This is the God of head bodily in Christ Jesus. Think about it. This was God in a human body walking the earth. This is what should come to your mind when you think about Jesus Christ. You should be worried about what color he was. You need to be worried about his glory, his deity, his divinity, his majesty, his, his omnipotence, his power. Because Jesus Christ was like no other. You know, you don't put Jesus' a name in the same name as earthly leaders and religious leaders of this earth. He is not even, they're not even in his league in any way. We're talking about the incarnate eternal son of God taking on a human body. He was incarnated from the time he was born till the time he rose from the dead. I hope y'all can receive that. The word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Right here had been a great time to say he was six feet four. Right here would be a great time to say his complexion was dark or light skinned. Right here would be a great time to tell us the color of his hair, all this kind of stuff. You don't see none of that. You don't see that in the New Testament. What you see is the revelation of the God-man, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, in his glory. And it says, he was full of grace, begotten of the Father, full of grace, the only begotten of the Father. Nobody else has come from the Father except Jesus Christ. Nobody else has seen the Father except Jesus Christ. This is why in John 14 and verse 8, John 14, verse 8, it says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said to him in verse 9, John 14, 9, have I not been so long with you yet, and you do have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the works that I do. Truly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, they shall do also, and greater works than these, because I go to my Father. Listen, Jesus Christ was the embodiment of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the Father, in the incarnation of the Son. This is mind-blowing. This is boggling. And our Christology, which I'm arguing for in this teaching, must become higher than some anthropological or sociological or some academic pursuit. You must see him in his glory, the only begotten of the Father. And then it goes back to John's testimony in verse 15. John bore witness of him, cried out, this is whom I've been saying, it is he who comes after me, he is preferred before me. And of his fullness, what we get is grace upon grace. Jesus Christ came to show you the grace of God in himself. Think how gracious it is to send 
the incarnate Son of God, to die for sinners. That's graciousness. That's favor that we don't deserve. And, and in this time when the flesh has propped itself up in religious activity, and, and we come into the sanctuary thinking we're doing him a favor by being here. Listen, my God, it's a privilege just to know him. It's a privilege just to be able to understand who he is. It's our privilege to worship him, for he has been so gracious to us. But verse 17 says, for the law was given through Moses. Moses brought down the Ten Commandments and said, this is what you got to do so you'll know when you're sinning or not. Moses brought the law, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The gracious, unmerited favor of God given to anybody who will believe on him as Messiah. And not only grace, but in Christ is the truth, the reality of true spiritual reality, the reality of all that is real and, and truthful. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in these culture of lies that we live in, if you want to know the truth, start with Jesus. This is why the enemy works so hard to distort your Christology, your understanding of Jesus Christ. That's why, as I've said in the past, many want to make Jesus like them instead of seeing Jesus for who he is. And as Paul said, we press toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You should be pressing to become like him, not trying to make him like us. So all these conversations about his church, you're hearing conversations about the white church, the black church, even now the brown church. Let me tell you something. The only church there is is the Christian church, the Christian church, the church that Christ is building. And never put some adjective before his church except Christian. And if you're in his church, you can be black, white, whatever ethnicity you want to be. But dare you not blaspheme the son of God's name by trying to identify his church with your racial and ethnicity or some social uh, uh, preference or some cultural preference. No, he's beyond all that. He's the glory of God. He's the presence. He's the Messiah. And as it says, we've received of his fullness grace for grace. Verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. Hallelujah. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. If you want to know the truth, it'll come through Jesus Christ. If you want to see his glory, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal who Jesus is. John the Baptist helps us as we go forward. We'll learn more next week. I'm excited. I pray you are. Join us next week on Disciple Talk as we go further in seeing the glory of, God, of, of Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John. God bless you. We'll see you next week. <music>